It's not every day that we have a guest who is the recipient of 20 golden platinum records. But it's bigger than that. The story of Jellybean Johnson is also the story about the entire state of Minnesota and uh, Minneapolis in particular that came to change the music world. We are sitting here in Sweden today, 2021, and talking about our love of music because of what happened in Minneapolis during the 70s. Minnesota, which, by the way, was the place where many of us from Scandinavian once emigrated. And it was for a long time also that place in the state with the largest number of white citizens. Growing up in an environment like, like that, like Jellybean and, and Prince did, meant for a long time that you were a bit marginalized. Jellybean tells us about the clubs and places that they were not allowed to visit, about the radio station that only played white rock music. So this is the story of Jellybean Johnson, but it's also a story of 20 or so young people to whom music became everything. It became an identity, it became a way away from crime, it became a craft that they refined by competing against each other on those few clubs that they were allowed to play on. In the program we also mentioned the so-called Minneapolis sound, and for those who do not know, you can say that it's a sub-genre of funk and rock that uh, combines elements of synthpop and uh, new wave. And uh, it's a direct result of the black minorities combination of James Brown, Sly Stone and the white music that, that they were growing up listening to during their upbringing. And uh, one crucial element is also that the horns, the horns arrangements are made through keyboards. So there you go. So enjoy this story and the ride. Here is Jellybean Johnson. So, hey, my pleasure. My pleasure. So, what we can say that there are there are a few people, uh, maybe a handful, that actually are responsible for the Minneapolis sound. And I guess it's mm -hmm. it's Prince, Morris, uh, Jesse Johnson, mm -hmm. Jimmy Terry, and it's Jellybean Johnson. Uh, <laughs> so, so you're actually the way we view it, one of the one of the responsible for the Minneapolis sound, I guess. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I was there. <laughs> so that's right. and, uh, and we, and then also you have a a lot of uh, top hits that you have produced. We're going to go into it with Mint Condition, Janet Jackson, and there are a lot of things under your, your yeah. belt as well. Yeah, so yeah. that's a bit of a context. So uh, we were proud to have you on our show. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. I travel all over this country and I tell people, a lot of them don't want to believe me, but I tell them that, you know, nobody has a music scene like us. Now, I'm not bragging on that or, or nothing, but that's a fact. You know, we, we, the music scene that we have here, you can't find in most cities in this, across the United States. I, I've been watching you. I think I want to know you. Know you. I said, I, I'm a little dangerous. We have met briefly a couple of times while I was in Minneapolis. Uh, one time in the Bunkers uh, Club. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, that's and, that's and the at, clubhouse. Uh, that's the clubhouse. Yeah, <laughs> Sonny was there as well and played. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
and then at this uh, Minnesota Music Club. Uh, that's the other clubhouse. Yeah, <laughs> that's the clubhouse too. So uh, yeah, so that that in some way brings us back to clubs, and I guess what would be interesting would be to go back to like 1975, 76, 77. Okay. I guess you were in the high school. There were teenagers. Yeah. Fly time, yeah. Grand Ole Central, Champagne. It was yeah. Wow. It, it, you know, we were 15, 16 years old, man. And, uh, you know, we, we had rival bands. You know, I was in Flight Time. Flight Time was like 10 pieces. Uh, Prince had uh, Grand Central, you know, uh, Grand Central Christmas to him and uh, and Andre Simone and his cousin Chad Smith and Linda Anderson. And uh, after that, uh, Morse joined them, you know. Yeah. So we, you know, we, we were, you know, we had our little bands. We were like 15, 16 years old, 17. And, uh, you know, we, we just loved to play, you know, we couldn't really play, couldn't really play the clubs. Uh, uh, we couldn't play the clubs because, you know, uh, the clubs here were mostly white and, you yeah. know, and we, we were like young black kids and, uh, and they just, you know, it, it was just, that's how it was, you know, so we accepted that, but it, 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 it did not stop us from getting our, you know, our craft together. You know, of course we were still in, in school and stuff. So, you know, most of us was at me, Terry and uh, David Island were athletes. So we were like on basketball teams, football teams, all that yeah. stuff. But we would come together at night and rehearse music because, you know, that was our second love. So, and, you know, that's how it was, you know. And just being around here 15, 16 years old and, and being as good as we were, it was it was a blessing. But it was also a curse too because we wanted to be able to play the clubs too, but we couldn't. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, of so yeah. Course. yeah. But uh, there, there weren't that many clubs to, to choose from then. No, it wasn't it wasn't that many at that time. And plus it was it wasn't that many anyway for us because we worked underage. Hmm. You know, so that too, you know. But uh we, we still played our share of sororities and you know Black functions and stuff like that. So you know that's how we help keep our our craft together because you know we, there was those on the weekend and stuff that we could do. So. What time is it? Jellybean. Come on, y'all. Everybody dance to the beat. Yeah, and your craft and uh, as as a drummer, guitarist, uh, you started you you started your drum playing um, in the early tens, I guess, twelve yeah, years yeah, old. Um, yeah, yeah. My mom, uh, first off, she moved me here from Chicago to keep me out of the gangs at like uh, you know twelve, thirteen years old. And from the ages from ten, eleven, twelve, you know, my mom would always, you know, she would buy me a drum set. <sighs> But it'd be one of these toy drum sets, like paper and stuff, so, you know. So she'd buy it, and I'd get it Christmas Day. By Christmas night, it was torn up. So uh, we moved here, and uh, when I turned 13, she finally got me a drum set that had was actually a real drum set. I oh. mean, it was cheap, but it was a real drum set. I couldn't destroy it. Oh. And uh, and that's when she saw that, you know, I had this passion to play the drums and stuff, and, which also mean I could stop beating on her coffee tables and pots and pans and all that stuff. <laughs> so uh, she, uh, that's a she good got thing. me, uh, she got me a drum set and she, uh, she saw I was serious about it. So she got me lessons, you know, mm -hmm. and see the only problem with lessons back in those days is that when you're a kid and, you know, 13 years old going to school and you go five days a week, you know, Monday through Friday, and you got to be there at eight o'clock in the morning. The last thing you want on Saturday, you know, you want to stay in asleep. Well, you can't, you know, if you, if I had a drum lesson at eight o'clock on Saturday morning, that, you know, that no, was, it, it, it wasn't a big hit. No. That's not really, yeah, you know, I really didn't want to do that. But anyway, I did it for like six months. And then I finally told her, I said, mom, you know, I don't really want to do the drum lessons anymore because first of all, it wasn't teaching me what I wanted to know. You know, I wanted to learn about James Brown and, to our, you know, all the drummers there, the Clyde Stubblefield and David Garibaldi. 
you know, Sly and the Family Stones, uh, Greg Rico. I want to play that kind of stuff. Wow. And the teacher was teaching me Jerry Lee Lewis and rock and roll beats and all that. Well, I didn't want to know those. So, so, <laughs> so she finally got me out and stuff. And I, I went back on the woodshed, you know, which woodshed for me was just basically laying down on the floor in front of our mm-hmm. stereo and learning these beats and then going down the basement and applying them to my drum set. So. Well, I can relate to that a little bit. At that yeah, age, yeah, yeah. I also played the drums, actually, and a bit guitar and stuff like that in a very low level. But, and I also had a teacher, you know, he had he had these tattoos all over and played this heavy metal, and I was like, well, yeah, yeah. I would like the funky drummer and sex man. And he was like, well, what's that? <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's different culture. But um, to talk about this this drumming thing, because you you, be, you evolved into a master drummer, and. Uh, Yeah, yeah. If you look at tutorials on the internet when it comes to drum playing, there is one track that comes back every now and then, and it's the seven 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 ninety three eleven. Yeah, it's like the <laughs> okay. There are drummers, there are good drummers, and then there are drummers who can do that song. And um, yeah, yeah. complicated song you've uh, dissected seven 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 ninety three eleven I mean okay. that that's <laughs> program by Prince on the Lindrum machine a lot of hi-hat rolls and it's kind of impossible because it's the roll and the snare hit at the same time, so that's what I do. I posted this clip to my Instagram. I've been getting a lot of people hit me up in my inbox asking me to do a tutorial video, showing them how to play this particular groove. Today is the day. The song is called 777-9311. And I got so, a bunch of requests for this, so I'm gonna redo it with some new insights. And that's 777-9311. Uh, as performed by Morris Day in the time, but we all know famously Prince on all the instruments. So let's get into it. I'm going to show you um, what I've discovered recently about this bass line, and uh, we'll go through all the sections. You hit two here after all that 30 second madness, really, and... Um It's really, really hard to try to slow this down or even to break it into little bits, but it's... So we are not... I, I can't play it. I have not enough limbs. So uh, what's interesting is no sound on the four, which makes it kind of harder to hit the four E with the snare. But more so, if you pay attention, there's on the three and and the three T, like the last sixteenth of three. There's hi hats, three and four and. I couldn't even tell you. All is going on right there, actually. I just said to myself, what am I doing, by the way? But I mean, that's that's the pattern. And, you know, I, I, there are some technical guys out here that can write it out and everything. Yeah. Right hand, left hand, this, that, the other. Uh, he's doing a, a triplet something there. I, I don't know all of that. It's the funkiest groove out there. Let me hit you with it. This is 777-9311. Morris Day and the Time, written, of course, by Prince. I mean, check this clip out from American Bandstand. I mean... Just, just wait, 
for the high hands. And I also remember if I re that John Blackwell, he had like when he had his kind of auditions at yeah. Paisley Park, he, yeah. he, was, he wasn't doing, he didn't thought he was doing that well. So he had like, I do that one and to get Prince attention. Yeah. And, yeah. But, <laughs> so I, I'm a bit curious about that track because you're actually, you you master it and you, I guess you were the first one playing it after that Prince, Prince have done it or how, how was the development of that track okay, have you, the, the, have, I, have I you a little secret about that first off that beat was developed developed on this, uh the Lynn drum machine by david garibaldi of tower power mm -hmm. and the uh, thing about david garibaldi is he is me prince and morris that that was our favorite drummer as kid it's so we love you know when he played the drums and everything so anyway i never forget when we put seven sevens out and stuff i remember being at rehearsal and uh uh, me, Prince, and Morris sat down at the drums, mm -hmm. and we had to figure out, you know, how is Jelly Bean going to play this beat in concert? Oh. And, you know, it's a play, tricky one. You know, yeah. Exactly. At least get a, uh, you know, at least get a, a good, you know, resemblance of it or whatever, mm -hmm. and still have his guys dance and stuff, you know, because all the other guys are dancing and stuff and in concerts. So you, you want to be able to, I want to be able to play it and still have them be able to dance comfortably to it. Yeah, and you know, so so me, Prince, and Moore sat down, and and we each took a turn at you know playing it because it's a it's a machine, you know. Just yeah. be honest here. <laughs> and we we keep, between the three of us, we got some close enough where I could you know, play it. Yeah. Feel comfortable with it. And that's what I've been doing the last 40 years with it. So wow. But it, it's a crazy beat. I, I got famous for it because my name's attached to it, but it, it's really David Garibaldi's, you know, brilliant. Okay. I actually told him that later too. I mean you know me and Morris have seen them in concert and I've told him, you know, I've actually jammed with the Tower Power ironically, I mean I jammed with him it was on the guitar with his drums, but so it was but I actually told David he, how much we so loved was, him coming up as a, as a drummer. So he was pro program programming it then. So it, how was Prince input into that track? Then? Yeah, he programmed. Yeah. Prince just he, you know, we had drum, you know, that was part of production back then, you know, and Prince was the one of the first of us using the the Lynn drum machine. Hmm. And you know, Prince was a genius. He heard that beat and he he created that song around that beat. You uh -huh. know, the bass line, the guitars. So with that, Prince was, you know, he was iconic like that. Mm -hmm. And he heard that beat and he knew it was something different, you know, yeah. and you guys know that, you know. Mm -hmm. He heard it was something different and he just made up a song around it and and named it a phone number. So it was just, just part of Prince's genius. That's all it was, basically. <laughs> we love that. Yeah. yeah, it's an amazing track. Uh, but to stay in, in that area, because uh, there were some kind of, you, you mentioned this yourself, that there were a few clubs that you were able to play on and it and it, you were kind of young. And so that's kind of, I guess, the, the theme that then came back in the Purple Rain movie in some kind of yeah, yeah, the competition yeah. between the teams. Cause... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, you know, it's funny too, because by time, you know, we did get one club gig here. Mm. Uh and we were like 16, 17 years old, and it was an old club here called the Flame Bar. Oh. And we were playing in there, like, you know, we got hired. I know the club owner probably shouldn't have hired us, you know. He didn't, I don't know if he really knew just how young we were, but he didn't care, you know. Oh. And it was downtown Minneapolis on Nicollet. And uh, it was funny, the unique thing about this club is like, one side was funk music, and the other side was country. 
Wow. So we were playing like six nights, seven nights a week and stuff, you know, at 16, 17 years old. And, and you know, that helped us too. But still, it was one of the very few clubs here, wow. if any, that we could play. You know, uh, Monday, that's how it was those nights. It was it was kind of like, you know, you always had more people on the weekend, Friday and Saturday. Yeah, you know, of, course. Than. of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, that's how it is, <laughs> you know. And uh, but still, it helped us develop as musicians because we're playing, you know, five, six nights a week. Sprinkled throughout downtown Minneapolis are a variety of jazz joints, nightclubs, restaurants, and discotheques. There are fern bars where the patrons are as potted as the plants. There are piano bars that tinkle like scotch against the rocks. And there are the quiet corner tables, fervently lit with romantic conversation. There are clubs that pour a whale of a drink and some places that are aptly named for the spirits imbibed within. Whatever the clubs are called, they all spell nightlife. In downtown Minneapolis, diversity is the drink of the night. But tonight we're going to take you to the variegated bars, the places you've probably never been, but have probably heard plenty about. Tonight we're going night clubbing, off the beaten path. Sam's is a happy hunting ground for mostly college-age disco and rock fans who come mainly to dance or to gawk at various video and film follies rolling across the overhead screens. Many repair to pinball machines in the rear. They stack up in Sam's like electronic wallflowers. If the bright lights and big beats are too much for you, try the 7th Street entry, just adjacent to Sam's. Some call it the Avant Garage. Others mistake it for a punk club. But there aren't any real punks at the 7th Street entry. Just a lot of short-haired, henna-haired, dyed-haired, rock-and-roll diehards. I love it. What I really like about it is, you know, when I grew up in flight time, the original flight time, we were 15, 16 years, we had five horns. Mm. You know, so we loved all the horn bands like Tower of Power, Ohio Players, Cooling the Game. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so I came from that. That's what flight time was when we were young, you know. So we had a horn section. And I know that that, that had an effect on Prince, you know, because Prince always, you know, was jealous of us because we had horns. And I think that's when he, learned, with his sound, he learned how to play horn parts on the keyboards, on the overhinds and stuff. And that's because uh. you know, he always wanted a horn section. But, you know, he couldn't, uh, uh, Grand Central was only like four or five pieces, so they didn't have, they had to come up with their own horns. Okay, so there, 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 there you have it, uh, Jelly. I told I saw, I told that you were responsible for the Minneapolis sound in the beginning, and <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, those, too kind. It's, too it's, kind. it's those horns in the flight time that made him create the sound, uh, so you're the guilty one. That. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I really like the song, uh, It's the Things That You Do, um, this song with, with Flight Time. Okay, yeah, that's, oh my God, that, that's you know, really, really the things track. that you do, wow, <laughs> that's the thing, that was, that, you know, that, that was part of our development, that was a song that we written when we were like teenagers, oh, yeah. and that, that was one of the songs we were using to trying to get a record deal, you know, uh -huh. to, to play, yeah, and, and you know, and that's where that came from, you know, things that we do. We had a couple, I think I, we did a ballad, we had a ballad and something else, you know. <laughs> and those were songs that we had written as a group to, to use to get us, you know, a record deal. that you know it's it's a record here i guess y'all heard that from the minneapolis you know from back in the day thing and it's funny you know because i just heard that a few years ago and i like tripping because you know i was 17 18 years old when i played on that you know and i hadn't uh i was just developing my skills as a songwriter and as a drummer and as you know guitar i played nobody really knew about that i played the guitar at this point because uh i was a drummer you know everybody you know me in the universe is a drummer so <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, we have one more specific question about some songs. Uh, it's the, the early song, uh, Do Yourself a Favor. Uh, okay, yeah. From, I, I guess it's from Pep Wills or Prince or something Pepe early. Willie. Yeah, but it's early Peppy Willie. That's, that's early Prince development. You know, yeah. Peppy was blessed to be around Prince like 13, 14 years old when Prince was 13, 14. And that was just that that like that song like like the song we had in flight time. That was one of Prince's early songs. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I know Peppy did, redid it, and Jesse Johnson redid it later and stuff. I, it's actually a, a, ver- a version out there in the universe of Prince doing it too. But yeah, because that, 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 that was a, part part of our question. Because when we look at that song, it's like, as you said, Jesse Johnson, there's Pep Will, there's Prince. There was also yeah. we, we also heard that the Gary Mud Boone Cooper from the P Funk. Uh, oh, well, well, part he, of the like, yeah, I, he, I love both. I love both. Yeah. yeah, he plays that regular on on his shows, and he said, uh-huh. oh, it's just kind yeah. of my tune." He said, "No." <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it seems like there were many people who have that song in some ways. Yeah, but, uh, I mean it's a great song, man. I loved it, but you know I didn't find out about. It. And you know what? Ironically, I didn't really realize know about the origin of that song until Jesse put it out on his solo record, and I heard him do it. Okay. I didn't, you know, I had been around Prince, but I had never heard that version. Of it, so it was, yeah, wow. <laughs> it's a cool song. That's that. That's early Minneapolis. Yeah, it? that's real. Very early, early. Then you developed into the the, the time, and you had uh, three three records uh, before you broke up uh, after the yeah up rain yeah. So it, I guess yeah. that that was a ride. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Uh, you know, the the you think you unique thing about the time is uh, we went from playing nightclubs to to you know Prince putting us out there in the stadiums and stuff and the arenas and the theaters and stuff. And me, it was a culture shock for me because you know I'm this snotty black, snotty nosed kid from you know North Side, and just used to play in a club occasionally and all that kind of stuff. And then to be sat in front of like our first gig was in front of 26,000 people in Detroit. Wow. And I'll never forget how intimidating and how you know how it, like it literally I was like. Scared. Without further ado, we're gonna bring on the masters of cool, ladies and gentlemen, Warner Brothers recording artists. It must have been played. a been a shock. You go from the small clubs. To it was a total gigantic. shock. It's a total shock <laughs> from playing a nightclub yeah. in front of twenty six thousand people and they're screaming your song. You know, wow. they're screaming to hear you. You know, because you know, Get It Up was a big hit in Detroit at that time because of the electrifying mojo. You know, he had yeah. made it a big hit. So, and we were like, you know, this mysterious band that Prince had. You know, I, it was funny too because a lot of people thought Prince was Morris. You know, <laughs> they thought, you know, <laughs> him and Morris. You know, they had the, the, the they were yellow and had that that poofy hair. They thought, oh well, no, wow. that's Prince. 
That's Prince Adam. But no, it wasn't. You know, it was Morris. But uh, we were like Prince's Black. You know, we were like his R&B side at that point. So. Define funk for me, because it's something, at least for me, that I hear, but I can't describe. Well, if you can describe it, it ain't funky. <laughs> Is it that simple? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, well. Is it in a beat? Uh, no. Uh, you know, I've given different answers to that. One time I just said Maceo Parker. So you would have to talk to him and listen to the tone of his voice and listen to how he relates to music and the things that move him. And there are many things that are funky, you know. Uh, at the time, they're funky. I can hear them in the background warming up now. They're opening up tonight. Yeah. Uh, but they're hard to describe, too. It's something you just have to experience. Uh, I got a fair skin, bro. Y'all sing it. I got a fireplace, too. I can't hear you. Well, I'm all the way live. Look out. All the things I can do to you. Wait. after you know morris left you know morris left at the end you know while we we had just played first avenue we played the one gig at, at first avenue remember those songs in in uh in purple rain the, the jungle the versions of junk for love and the bird are from that particular gig that we did you know he used the live versions of them for purple rain but anyway i i tell people that interview me i told me i said morris walked out the back door at the end of that gig because you know him and chris had been fighting he walked out the door at the end of that gig. I didn't see him for the next five years. I didn't see him until I had joined Flight Times Production as a producer, and we did Fishnet. So, uh, so that changed us. So then after that, uh, Jesse left shortly after that because Jesse got mad because uh, Prince liked Paul Peterson, you know, St. Paul. He liked Paul as an 18-year-old yeah. kid. And he told, you know, he basically told Jesse, well, you know, we'll put Paul up front. Well, you know, Jesse Johnson wasn't having that. He wasn't mm -hmm. going for that. So, so then he left. So then it's just me, Jerome, and Paul, you know, sitting there and we're trying to figure out the rest of the guys, you know, what we're going to do. And so, uh, Chris said, you know what, you know, we, we're going to do this band. We're going to have Paul fronted. And, uh, you know, Susanna was his girlfriend at this time, you know. And he said, we're just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna name it the family. You know, he had, not, now there's an iconic group here. I guess you guys know about, you know, the family. There was a band here called The Family that Prince was in briefly <laughs> when he's here. So, you know, I really thought he was taking that, but you know, his whole thing is that we had a lot of family connections in that band. You know, Susanna's uh, sister was Wendy, you know, Eric Lees was his, Alan, and Alan was Prince's world manager. Well, and the family, I guess that album, at least in the way, in my perspective, it, it marks uh, some kind of a new di direction in, in Prince music, a more jazzy feel. Than, than, Absolutely. Than, and I guess it's Eric Leeds' influence and yeah. stuff like that, but it's it's kind of a it was it, sh it, shifter. It, it, yeah, yeah. And you know, that, that, that record is really iconic for the fact is that it, it brought a whole different side of Prince, mm. you know, as far as it was more jazzier, it was funk and jazz. Um, and it, it was a whole like you know the fusion side of us and stuff you know and it was a musician's band it's basically that's what it was basically yeah. and it, it just brought the you know between the four or five of us that's you know, we brought a whole different side than the, the funkiness maybe at the time it was funky but it was a different kind of funk it was more sophisticated 
you know, you had the iconic ballads like Nothing Compares to You. Yeah. You had the you had the big string section which Claire Fisher arranged strings and all that stuff. So it it was cool. It was it was just another side of Prince. You know, Prince had many sides. So it's yeah. different on this side. side. Produced for me two special songs. That is one of my favorite of all time. Actually, it's uh, "Criticize" and um, "Why Should I Cry" with Nona Hendrix. Yeah, you know, "Why Should I Cry" was the very first production I did after I got fired by Prince out of Paisley, out right. of Paisley Park. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and I joined Flight Time. You know, and uh, and I personally I didn't know if I could produce. I, I you know Terry and Jimmy always encouraged me and stuff. But I wasn't sure, you know, and I had joined, you know, I had joined their production company and I was getting my feet wet. And I, I'm gonna be honest, kind of like with the first time the time played in front of 26,000 people it was the same thing with production on it was producing somebody. Here it is. Uh, they're asking me to produce this iconic singer, you know, known as iconic because she came from Patti LaBelle and you know, exactly. all that. I had grown up watching her, you know, mm. and uh, and, you know, I made the track. I got the track together and stuff. And then I never forget, she was so nice to me, you know, because she knew, I think she knew deep down. Because, so, see, you got to realize with Terry and Jimmy, anybody that came to their production company at that point, any artist came, they wanted Terry and Jimmy. They didn't want some other guy working for them, you know. So any any artist that came to them was skeptical, you know, about, well, you know, we really want, you know, they're dumping you off on me, but we really want Terry and Jimmy and all that. And Terry and Jimmy will always tell them, well, you know, we're around. You know, we're not, you know, we'll help him, you know, so just, you know, just give him a chance. So uh, I never forget we were in there and I finally, I had never really done vocals before. I'd done music, you know, fires producing the music and everything. But doing vocals is a whole total different thing. You know, you have to get the artist to believe what you're telling them. First of all, you got to write a set of lyrics that they, yeah. you know, believe in, and that exactly. can they can, you know. It's a totally different, different thing. thing. Yes, it's a whole different yeah. thing. You know, and uh, I never forget. She told me. She said, "Baby, now this is how we're gonna do it. We say we're gonna 
We're going to sing it through a couple of times, maybe three or four times. And then I want you to take what you want out of that. And then you make the lyrics. Hmm. And me, you know, I was so new to it. I didn't know that you could do that, but yes, you could, hmm. you know. Wow. So that's what we did, you know. Now, I had been watching Terry. You know, Terry and Jimmy had came from that Leon, uh, Leon Silver school of, you know, singing where you make the artist sing it 90 zillion times and then go home and come back and sing it again the next day, <laughs> you know. Uh. And, I, I, you know, she didn't, you know, I think, I think Nona had been through that and didn't want to do that, you know. And so we, we, I had her sing it through, uh, for, you know, I said, of course you stop a couple places where it's flat or sharp, whatever, or mm. the word didn't come out right. And we did that for a bit. And then I got about three or four passes through. And then I, I started to take, I edited, you know, the different lines that I like. And that's how we came out with it, you know. And trust me, I was as shocked as anybody. When it went to the top five, I was as shocked as anybody because I, you know, I was like, damn. You did a great job, man. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you came here to party, this is your opportunity to shake it like Have you ever made a collab uh, with with, uh, with Seth and Roger? Well, well, uh, the the thing with Roger is the first year we were out with the time, the Zap was on that first tour that we did with Prince. It was uh, the time, Zap, and Prince. So we we did a good three four months around them, man. We were uh, it was a great time. Roger was always nice to me. And I was really, you know, I knew his brother too that killed him and stuff. It, it really hurt us. He, his, we used to, the, you know, the guys in the time was young and cocky. Mm. And Roger's brother, uh, Larry, didn't particularly like us. We would not, we would not take shit from him. We would not. We knew, you know, he was trying to be boss. He hated us because we were young and cocky. I'm all confused. I don't know where the party is. Yeah, you have Man. really, really been in the center of, of a lot of ex ex amazing. Uh, yeah, I have. A lot of people, people. don't know, but yeah, yeah. I, I've been in the center of a lot of craziness, man. Really but uh, all, all of the experience you have, and all the meetings, and all the productions, and all the songs, and all the different collaborations. Yeah, is 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 there, is there something that you're? What is the highlight? What's something you're most proud of? Uh, okay. Well, probably one of the, the main things I'm most proud of is doing Black Cat on Janet. You know, mm. um, I, you know, I'm like everybody else. I grew up listening to Jackson Five. I grew up listening to Michael, mm. and she approached me with that song. It, it was on a piano. It wasn't even on a guitar and shit. It, you know, the little riff that's in the main riff of Black Cat. She approached me with a piano. And you know how I think it goes back to my, my experience with heavy guitars and stuff like that. I'm thinking, you know what, I could probably you know, rock this out pretty good. And my whole thing with her, I told her, I said, you know what, I'm thinking, your brother has Beat It, Dirty Diana, and all this kind of stuff, yeah. but you don't have this kind of song, you know? So I'm going to see what we do. So she That's something to totally back. different. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Totally yeah. Different, even totally different from what I was doing at that point because I've been doing funky stuff. I had the guitar in there, but it wasn't like a hard rock song like that, you know? No. And so I, I just wanted to prove to myself that I could do it, you know? Mm. But anyway, we wanted this to be, I wanted this to be heavier, you know? So we did a pass with, with uh, the Rockman thing, you know, actually the dude in Boston, y'all know the rock band Boston? That's the guy that developed that particular mm. effect. And we, so we did a pass to that, and then we did a pass to it with a Marshall. Mm. And, uh, and so all of a sudden we had this iconic song and I'm like, wow, you know, I, it's totally different. Yes, it stands out in its totally own way. Like Absolutely. Ever did. Yeah, anything, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it was on. And then you guys got to remember too, during this time, the heavy metal you know, people, the heavy metal was big yeah. music then. You know, you had yeah. your Rats and Van Halen and Dawkins and you know all these different iconic bands. And so, uh, and this song fit right in with them and stuff. 
The other thing too is all the heavy metal cats. I never forget the heavy metal cats, Rock and the Aerosmith, and all these guys, uh, Motley Crue. All of them was tripping. Yeah. It's like, what the hell is who has Janet Jackson come up with something like this? It has been an honor to have you uh, on the show, Jellybean. So, uh, thank you, thank you, you my pleasure. And we're, as we said, we're very thankful for uh, what you have brought to the music scene. Actually, thank all over you. the world with the Minneapolis sound and everything. So, uh, it's a thank big, you. big honor. This old war horse. I'm just trying to hang around, y'all. I'm trying to play. There's going to be more to come. Trust me. Showtime! Facebook and our homepage 